Hey, good morning, Grace. Welcome to Grace Church Online. We are so happy that you are here today, that you have joined us. It doesn't matter if you're on the road heading to the beach in your car, if you're at home in your pajamas, you know, in your bed or on your couch, wherever you are. If you are new, we welcome you. Thank you all for joining us today. We are glad that you have joined us for Church Online, for Church at Home. I wanted to give you a quick update uh, on one of our members, Linda Tenhove. Uh, she messaged me this morning to give me an update on, on a scan. Uh, as you know, she's been struggling with cancer, and uh, she has a great praise report she wanted to give to the Lord. She said uh, uh, she just had a scan done, and only one spot didn't change. All the others are teeny tiny, barely visible, and she said, God is still working on me. And uh, she said that the oncologist used the words like amazing for her blood work and for the scan. So, Linda, we are so happy for you. We praise the Lord and we rejoice with you in what God has done for you and what God is doing. We, uh, uh, of course, it's the 4th of July weekend, and I hope that uh, you've had a great weekend celebrating the 4th of July. Uh, the freedom that we have, but also the continued struggle that we have to form a more perfect union. Uh, the battle continues. Today we're continuing our series, Relational Values. We're on part four, and what we're doing is we are looking at values that are important if we value relationships. These are values that, uh, without these values, relationships would really be impossible. These values help to give birth to the relationships, relationships help to nurture them, help them to grow, and cause them to thrive over time. It's also uh, values that helps if something happens to the relationship where it is damaged, where it is broken, that that relationship can be healed and restored. Uh, and I have one that I want to talk about you today that uh, is often overlooked, but it is so vital to our relationships, and uh, I want to share it with you today. But let me ask you a question. Any, do you remember the sitcom Cheers? Anybody remember the sitcom Cheers? There's a character in there named Norm. If you don't, that's okay. You can Google it or probably watch Hulu and see it. Uh, he was asked one day how his day was going, and he said, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and I'm wearing milk bone underwear. Does anybody feel like you're wearing milk bone underwear today? Anybody? Uh, you're having a hard time. Things are tough. I mean, things are beating you up, beating you down. Uh, you feel isolated, lonely, disconnected, forgotten. You are tired, weary, and worn. You're battered and bruised. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, there's reason for that. As we look around our world today, there's no shortage of reasons why we shouldn't feel anxious, concerned, or even uh, and discouraged. You know, corona is still around. The rona is still making its rounds, and it doesn't seem to be going away at this point in time. Uh, plans continue to be changed or canceled because of what's going on. Life as we know it isn't back to normal, and that causes a level of uncertainty, which it can be a bad thing, but there can be a good thing, too, because there's some things we're not doing now that maybe we don't need to go back to doing. And speaking of uncertainty, there's a lot of uncertainty because we don't know what's going to happen with our schools. You know, are they going to open? They're going to close? How that's going to work out? Uh, we don't know about, like, things with the economy. You know, things have looked good, but people are still, you know, it's, so it's a real mess there. Uh, what's happening in our nation? What's happening in the world? There's a lot of reason for uncertainty. And, and and the fact is that there are bad things that people continue to experience that continue to happen in life. Uh, there is uh, uh, marriage strife and problems. We have racial tensions. We have uh, people dealing with abuse, addictions, uh, dealing with cancer, and even the death of someone that they loved. So if you look around, it would be very easy to be disheartened and discouraged. Uh, Kerry Newhoff said this, and I think he really captures the reality of this when he said, I think we underestimate, we underestimate how discouraging life can be, how empty it can feel when you feel all alone, cut off from community, isolated. And loneliness has always been a problem that people have struggled with, and it has just gotten worse through this isolation, this period of isolation. And that is causing us to live in some ways contrary to our design. And the natural result of that is we become very discouraged. Now, the sad thing is that many of us are good at putting on a happy face when we are discouraged in our heart. We mask our discouragement. There is something about us, and I don't know if it's because of our rugged individualism or, or pride or what, but there is something in us that does not like being open, transparent, vulnerable, and doesn't like to ask for help. 
many times we feel like we're the only ones that are discouraged, but simply, it's simply not true. There is a really good chance, by the way, if you are feeling discouraged, that there are plenty of people around you who are feeling the exact same way. And don't, please don't ever underestimate how discouraging life can be. And one of the things that happens is the reason we don't see it around us is because we can be so discouraged in ourselves that we fail to see it in the people around us. The writer of Proverbs addresses this in chapter 12, verse 25. Proverbs is what is called, my teacher in school called, the horse sense of the Old Testament. It is a book of wise sayings and Proverbs. And he begins the proverb by saying this, an anxious heart weighs a man down. An anxious heart weighs a man down. That is, the cares and concerns of this life, the things that we're dealing with, the situations and circumstances that we are going through can be so overwhelming, it will weigh you down. The word about weighing down literally speaks of a a bowing down. In a positive sense, it, it expresses worship. But in this sense, with an anxious heart, it expresses how much pressure, the weight that is on a person that causes them to bow down. You might remember stepping outside, seeing it, or pictures of this, uh, when, when it ices over and how trees, because they get so top-heavy, the pressure just causes them to bow down to the pressure and to the weight. And that's a very good picture of what the writer of Proverbs here is describing what happens to us when we get so disheartened and discouraged, our hearts are anxious, and we get weighed down. And as I said, if we look around the world today, we have plenty of reasons for an anxious heart. People are stressed, anxious, fearful, angry, insecure, discouraged, and that's everywhere around us. A a, a few weeks ago, just a couple weeks after we had entered into phase two in North Carolina of reopening, we had a staff lunch that out, and uh, we went out to eat, to gather, and to plan, and to talk, and just be together again. And while we were there, we were getting ready to leave, I ran to the restroom, at the restaurant, and over in the corner, by himself, isolated from everyone else, was a police officer. And when I looked at this man, he looked like he was carrying the weight of the world, that he was isolated from everyone, and that he didn't have a friend in the world. This was after uh, George Floyd had been killed at the hands of police officer. Uh, Protests erupted. Riots happened. There was a lot of clash and conflict and had been going on for a short period of time. And you could see that it was just anxiety. It was wearing him down. You could see he was literally, you could see it on his countenance how he was bowed down. He had an anxious heart. And it perfectly describes how many people feel today. And maybe that describes how you feel. Jonathan Edwards wrote a letter to his daughter, and in in that letter he said, Perpetual sunshine is not usual in this world, even to God's true saints. Perpetual sunshine is not usual in this world. That's just not the way this world is. Now, most of us will freely acknowledge that. We'll go, oh, yeah, well, life's not perfect. There's going to be problems in this world. And if you're a believer in Jesus, you're quick to acknowledge, oh, yeah, well, Jesus said we're going to have troubles in this world. But there's something about us that still goes, but I shouldn't have this problem. I shouldn't face this struggle. Things shouldn't be difficult. For some reason, we believe that. And as a result of that, we end up disappointed, disillusioned. We end up with an anxious heart and discouragement. You may know someone today that's true of. In fact, as I'm talking right now, God is bringing someone to your mind that you could speak to. Maybe it's describing you. It could be a family member, a friend, a co-worker, a neighbor, a fellow church member, whoever. They are feeling down and discouraged. I have good news for you today because this proverb doesn't end with discouragement. And the answer that the writer gives us is an important relational value. We don't need to underestimate the reality of discouragement But the good thing is, with this relational value, we get to be involved in a process where we get to do something and be a reflection of God's love to people. This is the rest of the verse. An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Now listen, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. What is a kind word? Well, in the Hebrew, it literally means a good word. It is a word that brings comfort, that inspires, that brings hope. It's kind. It lifts up. It breathes life. It encourages. 
And that's what really it means. It, it brings cheer. And the word cheer means it causes a person to rejoice or to be glad. So this is so important as we look at life today, as we see people around us or even for ourselves. Encouragement brings joy to an anxious heart. Encouragement. There is something that is transforming about an encouraging word, a kind word, a good word. There is an amazing transformation that can take place in the mental state of a person, in the emotional state of a person, in the spiritual state of a person that reflects physically when they are being weighed down with an anxious heart and someone speaks a word of encouragement to them. You see, just as an anxious heart will cause a person to be weighed down, a word of encouragement begins to pump, you know, pump them up, you know. It begins to encourage them. It builds them up. It lifts them up. It's like they had a flat tire, but someone came along and just pumped them full of air, and it lifted them up. It causes them to rejoice and be glad. Kerry Newoff, <clears throat> in his quote, said this. I want to read the rest of it. He says, I think we underestimate how discouraging life can be. And he goes on and he says, and I think we underestimate how much a word of encouragement can put the wind back in just about everybody's sails. See, we can underestimate, we can devalue this important relational value of encouragement. Don't underestimate the power of encouragement. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you were the one with the anxious heart. You were the one that was weighed down, but someone came along and they had a, a, a kind word. They had a good word. They spoke to you a, cheer, a, a word of encouragement and it brought cheer into your heart and into your life. It was timely. It was beautiful. It was life-giving. It lifted you up. It brought you hope, strength, comfort, and encouragement. I'm reminded how in the Old Testament it says at the beginning in Genesis that God spoke and he said it's good. And there is something that happens that when we speak words of encouragement, that's good. Life isn't always good. And so what we find out is we need one another to speak words of encouragement. In fact, the Bible tells us we are supposed to do this daily. In Hebrews 3.13, the writer says, but encourage one another, what? Daily. We are supposed to have a habit of practice of encouraging one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, it's important to understand what's happening here. Because things are difficult, because we can be anxious and our hearts can weigh us down, we need to realize that sin is actively at work in the world. And if we're not careful, sin can come to work in our heart and life to bring us down because it's deceitful. Sin deceives us. It will make you believe that God isn't sovereign. It will make you believe that God is in control, isn't in control. It will make you believe that God isn't there with you, that God doesn't care about you, that somehow God has abandoned you or that there is no God at all. Sin can work through your circumstances and it can work through other people to drag you down, weigh you down, harden your heart, and perhaps even turn you away from the living God. But God has given us this amazing gift, encouragement. It is a gift we are not supposed to keep to ourselves. We are supposed to freely share it with one another. And it really needs to become a daily habit in our hearts and our lives, with our, our spouse, with our children, at work. If we're an employer speaking to our employees, if we're employees speaking to our em fellow employees and to people around us, maybe you're going to the store. Speak a word of encouragement. You see someone that looks down. Speak a word of encouragement. Let people know there's a God in heaven who loves them. Let them know that you recognize them, you see them, and that they're going to get through it. The writer of Proverbs in chapter 15, verse 23 says this. So, so by the way, let's be clear about this. We should have a daily discipline, a, a habit. It should be natural for us as God's people to speak words of encouragement daily to one another. And the writer says in 15, verse 23 of Proverbs, a man finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word. I want you to notice something here about what happens when we become encouragers, okay? Here's what happens. When you give encouragement, you get encouragement. When you bring joy to someone else, 
you find joy in the process. See, you find joy when you give an encouragement. Have you ever noticed that when you've taken time to talk to someone to encourage them, it not only helps them, but it does something to you too? Have you ever noticed that? I, that's one of the things as I look back and I think about that moment with that officer, how that was true for me. It encouraged him. It brought cheer. It brought joy to him, but it also did something for me as well. Listen, it is, uh, it is no wonder that the writer here says, how good is a timely word. It is such an important thing. Encouragement is one of the best two-for-one deals in the kingdom of God because as I encourage other people, I am encouraged myself. When I bring joy to other people, when they're anxious and their heart is weighing them down, and I speak words that encourage them and it brings them joy, I find joy in the process. It is an amazing thing. It's another good reason why we should be encouragers and why, uh, as a relational virtue, encouragement is so important. Now, let me address something here that is a a fact of life that happens. There are times in our lives when our hearts weigh us down, we are anxious, and we feel the weight of that, and it's causing us to bow down, and we're looking for anyone to come along to bring us a word of encouragement to help us along the way, and it doesn't happen. What do you do? Well, one thing you could do is you could talk to someone, but you have to get rid of that rugged individualism, I can do it all by myself, which is not the way we were created. That's one thing you can do. But sometimes the times and the places where we need help in situations and circumstances, that help doesn't come from the people around us. David experienced this. And the question is, what do you do when that happens? David and his mighty men were battle-tested, accomplished warriors. They were on their way back home, and they lived in a town called Ziklag. When they were approaching, they discovered that the Amalekites had attacked pillaged and destroyed their city. They had burned everything down. They came into the town and they found out that their sons, their daughters, their wives, all of them were taken. The young and old, all were gone. They were not killed, but they were taken and likely they were going to be sold in the Egyptian slave market. And when they saw everything that was happened, their home down, everyone gone, everything that they loved and they built was gone, these mighty men did the only thing they could do when their greatest fear was realized. David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. These hardened warriors, battle-tested on the battlefield, were crushed by what they saw, by what they uh, experienced, by their loss, and they wept until they had no more strength to weep. They couldn't cry anymore. They didn't have any strength left to cry. That is a difficult place to be. And this was a a grievous blow. It was a painful, hard, difficult moment and experience. But things got even worse for David. After these men had cried all they could cry, till they had no strength left to cry, they decided it was time for action. After all, they were men of action. And what did they want to do? In 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, we're told, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. Now understand this. These mighty men of valor, these brothers in arms, these guys who had stood shoulder to shoulder, who bled for one another, who fought at David's side, who had pledged to give their life to to protect him, These men were now talking about killing him. These were guys that were his inner circle, who typically had his back, who were in his corner. But their depth of bitterness in spirit was so great, this bitterness infected them all. Their hearts were anxious, worn down, and they were bowed down with bitterness. No one spoke a word of encouragement to David. No one supported a voiced support for him. No one remembered his previous leadership or how he had led them into multiple victories. Not a single man at this point in time was in his corner. I heard a saying a couple months ago, and it just stuck with me. I don't know who said this, but I've spent some time thinking about it. And it said this, 
just because someone is in your circle doesn't mean that they are in your corner. Just because someone is in your circle doesn't mean they are in your corner. And there's a lot of truth we could unpack here, and I don't want to get too caught up on anything that doesn't go with this, but there are people that you have who are in your circle, and they're in your circle because they want what you can give them, what you do for them. And, that, and once they're not getting what they want, they'll disappear, they'll step away. They won't be in your corner. But it's also possible that there are people who would normally be in your corner. And listen, I've seen this happen. People who would normally be in your corner, they're just, but they're so overwhelmed with something, so overwhelmed with something they're experiencing that they can't see beyond themselves to be in your corner at that time that you need it. That happens. It happened to David. And the question is when that word of encouragement isn't coming from the people in your circle who are normally in your corner, what do you do then? David tells us. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. Listen to this. But, but David found strength in the Lord his God. But there is a strong contrast here. The circumstances were against David. David's own men were against him. But hear this. David was not alone where he wasn't getting strength and encouragement from the circumstances or from the people that he would normally get it from, he found strength and encouragement in the Lord his God. What does that mean? It means he didn't look to himself. He didn't find some hidden reserve inside of him and go, oh, I can handle this, and it caused him to bow up and stand upright and like, I got this under control. It wasn't any of that. It wasn't any kind of positive, oh, I think I can, I think I can. It wasn't any of that at all. What it was is David began to, to think about the Lord and all that the Lord had done for him. He began to think about the time that he was a shepherd boy and he had care, responsibility for caring for the sheep and the lion came and God allowed him, gave him strength to defeat the lion. And when the bear came, God gave him strength to defeat the bear. And when the time came that Goliath was defying the armies of Israel and every man was running scared, even the king himself, David was the one who looked at that and stood up and said, you know what? You mock God, God's going to strike you down. And he stood in faith. He found, he began to remember about how uh, he had been delivered from Saul. Saul had tried multiple times to kill him, and God had been faithful to him. And he remembered the friendship that he had with Saul's son, Jonathan. And Jonathan helped to save his life. He began to reflect back on his life, the promises of God, how God had been with him, and all that God had done for him. So the lion, the bear, Goliath, Saul, and everything else, the God who was faithful then was faithful now. And so David found strength in the Lord his God. And that's what we need to learn to do. You know, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And that's so important because hear me on this. While others may fail you, while others may fail to be in the corner when you need it most, you have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus Christ. David found strength in the Lord his God. Now, don't misunderstand me. We need people in our corner who are in our circle and in our corner who speak words to encourage us. We need that. But one thing we all need to learn how to do is we need to learn how to find strength in the Lord our God because there can be moments and times where it's not coming from anyone else, but there is one place you can go. There is one brother that you have that will always be in your corner. He will be with you always, never leave you nor forsake you. He will be with you until the very end of the age. When all else fails, there is one who will continue to love you, lift you up, inspire you, bring hope, and breathe life into you. Jesus will speak timely and beautiful words into your heart, into your life that will bring comfort, encouragement, strength. It will build you up. It will give you life. And it will help you to face whatever adversity is that you are facing. Where your heart was melting before, where your heart was bowing down because of the weight and the pressure, because you took time, you learned how to find strength in the Lord your God, it will build you up. And suddenly what seemed so big becomes small when you realize it and you confront it in faith with the God who is with you.
When everything else fails, remember this. When everything else fails and when everyone else fails, Jesus is in your corner. Jesus is in your corner, and he will encourage you. He will beckon you on. He will lift up your head when it goes down. He will give you grace when you are weak. He will encourage you when you are downcast and on this. That's my Jesus, and that's your Jesus too. That's my Jesus, and that's your Jesus too. And, and see, there's an old hymn that we used to be sung church, some churches still sing it, but it says, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. Why? Because all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We need to learn how to find strength and encouragement in the Lord our God. And I want you to hear this because I love what Tony Evans said here. He says, while other people may walk on you, Jesus will walk with you. Let that sink in. People may walk on you. Circumstances and situations may walk on you. But Jesus won't. Jesus will walk with you through whatever it is that you're facing and going through. Through the good, the bad, the ups and the downs through your successes and your failures, through your obedience and through your sin, in life and in death, Jesus will walk with you. Again, he said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Nothing can separate us from his love. Encouragement, such a vital, important relational value. It is easy to underestimate discouragement, and it is easy to underestimate the value of encouragement, how it can breathe life, inspire hope, and cause someone who is weighed down with anxiety, how a word of encouragement can challenge them, encourage them, build them up, and lift them up, and change the way they are. It can affect them mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically a word of encouragement, a word that we need to practice. We need to be people of encouragement. You know, God is an encourager. We should be encouragers. We need to uh, bring uh, encouragement to others because as we encourage others, we bring joy to them, and what happens is we find joy in the process. I want to remind you again today that God commands us. God commands us to encourage one another daily. It needs to be a habit. Why don't you take time this week, make it a priority, put it into practice. Find right now, uh, commit to it right now that you are going to spend this week encouraging, to speak words of encouragement to your family members, to your friends, to your spouse, to your children, to to people in your neighborhood, to people you come into contact with at at the grocery store, wherever you are, wherever it is, Decide today, this week, I am going to be intentional and I am going to cultivate this value of encouragement. And you're going to find that you are encouraged in the process. And remember this too. Though everything, all hell may break loose against you, everything may seem to go wrong, and the friends that you are looking for may not at that moment in time, for whatever reason, be speaking encouragement into your life. You can find encouragement because you can find strength in the Lord your God. You can find strength through your Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to learn how to, our encourage, how to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We're going to take communion at this time, the Lord's Supper. And as we do this, I want you to be encouraged today. I want you to know that there is a God in heaven who loves you. There is a Savior who came and gave His life for you. And if you put your faith and your trust in Him, others may walk on you. Circumstances may walk on you. But Jesus will walk with you. And all you have to do is put your faith, your trust in Him and follow after Him. And the Bible says that you'll be saved. You'll you'll become a disciple of Jesus. He is good. He is good. In a world that's filled with discouragement, we can find encouragement in our Savior.
who loves us so. He must love us. He came and He gave His life for us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took the bread, He blessed it, He broke it, and He said to His disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. He did this for us. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Would you take and eat? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood. This cup represents my blood being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. It's, it's for you. It's for me. Drink this in remembrance of me. Would you drink in remembrance of me? Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, it is easy to underestimate the discouragement that people are experiencing and feeling at this time and at this place in our world. There's a lot of mess going on. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of sorrow. But it's also easy to underestimate the importance of encouragement. It's such an important relational value because, God, you encourage us. You remind us that you love us, that you are with us. You remind us that you are faithful, you are true. You remind us that you have given us promises that we should cling and hold tightly to. So thank you for your encouragement. Thank you that you love us and that you encourage us. Help us to be people of encouragement. Help us to be encouragers to our family, to our friends, to our spouse, to at work, wherever we are. May we develop this important relational value, a daily habit of encouraging one another. Because that's something that you have commanded us to do. Because when we encourage, we are doing what you yourself do, and we reflect your love to others. The other amazing thing is that as we encourage one another, we find encouragement ourselves. Thank you so much for that. That's such an amazing thing. What a wonderful gift that you have given to us. And Father, in moments and times when we might experience difficulty, when it seems like that we're all alone and no one is in our corner, help us to remember that Jesus is in our corner and he will never leave us or forsake us. And he is going to root for us. He's going to cheer us on. He's going to walk with us through life, through death, through everything in between. And because of him, we will be more than conquerors. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.